Tonight on Y News. A Senate committee cited police Major Rodney Baloyo in contempt for allegedly lying in a legislative hearing today. Philippine National Police Chief Police General Oscar Albayalde says he is willing to be investigated anew over the anomalous 2013 Pampanga drug raid. The NBI releases the results of the forensic examination on phone conversations made by Bucor personnel involved in the GCTA for sale controversy. President Rodrigo Duterte is eyeing to sign a bilateral labor agreement with Russia for the overseas Filipino workers in the country. And LRT2 halts operations as power rectifier trips and causes a fire. Good evening. The Senate Blue Ribbon Committee hearing on the alleged Agaw Bato scheme in 2013 continued today. Senators cited Police Major Rodney Baloyo in contempt for continuously lying to the committee. Grace Cassin tells us why. The commitment order of Police Major Rodney Baloyo placed under the custody of the new believed prison is out and signed by Senate Blue Ribbon Committee Chairman Richard Gordon. Former Pampanga Police Director Retired General Manuel Gailran testified before the committee. He opposed all Baloyo's statements on what transpired during the 2013 Agabato incident in Pampanga. Former PNP CIDG Chief Benjamin Magalong stated 200 kilos of illegal drugs was confiscated during the operation led by Baloyo. But Baloyo insists they seized only 30 kilos of illegal drugs. Baloyo also said they used 100 pieces of 1,000 peso bills as marked money. But the senators presented a video footage on the said operation with marked money of 500 peso bills. Witnesses were presented during the hearing who testified the operation was conducted in the morning and not in the afternoon. Retired General Gael Ran said Baloyo was lying to the committee. And yung mga report po na sinamit ng uh, office ni uh, Colonel Baloyo through the provincial director at nakarating po sa amin sa regional office. Ako na po ang magsasabi, puro po kasi, kasinungalingan yun. Iko-confirm ko po. Kanina na kasi nangalingan? Yung kanilang spot report. Kasinungalingan po lahat yun. That was an attempt to cover up the what really happened. The senator is urged Baloyo to tell the truth, but he stuck on his previous statement. You're not only going to be under contempt right now, but with all the statements made here, you're facing a crime of perjury. Your Honor, yun po talaga yung aking affidavit. So you stand by your story? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Senator Panfilo Lacson wants to have a reinvestigation on the case. I will address this to General Albayalde. You can still reinvestigate these people based on this, you know, the information gathered during this in this hearing. We will, sir, okay, kindly reinvestigate the administrative case and, uh, you know, uh, bigyan nyo ng karapatang parusa based on what we are hearing in this. We will, sir, committee hearing. Thank you. Mayor Magalong, on the other hand, maintained that his testimonies against General Albayalde are not personal. He said the PNP chief just made his choice as a former director of the Pampanga police, leading them to this situation. During that particular incident, you have choices. Ano choice mo doon? To do what is right. Nung nakita mo sana na may nangyayari ng naamoy mo na may irregularity rito, you should have something that is right or you did not do anything at all. Yan ang choices mo, or probably other more choices. Nandito tayo ngayon. Bakit tayo nandito? Obviously, you made your choice. Senator Gordon went emotional due to his frustration as high officials are being dragged in their probe. The senator said they are now drafting the initial committee report on the issue. Grace Cassin, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. Earlier in an ambush interview, former Chief PNP CIDG and Baguio City Mayor Benjamin Magalong confirmed that there is a kill order from a contract killer to liquidate him and his family due to his testimony in the Senate hearing. 
hindi ko alam eh. Uh, kaninang umaga lang, eh, tinaw- tinext na kagad ako nung, nung security ko at tinext na rin siya ng isang, isang gun for hire. Na, yung kilala niyang gun for hire, eh, may kumausap na raw at uh, pinagpan ako. So, I just have to, you know, uh, be conscious of my security. Making sure na lalo-lalo na sa aking family. As I've said, uh, More than 5,000 inmates die every year in the new Bilibid prison. This is according to the chief of the NBP hospital. The revelation comes amid the, the issues hounding the Bureau of Corrections. Nel Maribohok details why. The Senate Blue Ribbon Committee discussed yet again the alleged irregularities in the Bureau of Corrections or Bucor. During today's hearing, the status of inmates who died in the new believed prison emerged. 20% of maximum NBP allowed, sir. Sorry? And on NBP allowed, sir, new believed prison. New believed? Yes, 20%. Yes, po. Because there are about uh, 26,000. 26,000. So 5,200 na mamatay taon-taon, Mr. Chair? Uh, that's a lot. Because of the overcrowding, sir, minsan. Because of the overcrowding? Yes, po. Yung po at minsan. And then, hindi natin ma- ma-contain minsan yung PTV po. Some senators were shocked upon hearing such figure. This report comes amid the issue of the so-called hospital pass for sale in which high-profile inmates can avail of passes to be transferred to the NBP hospital to continue their illegal transactions. According to Philippine National Police Chief Police General Oscar Albayalde, there are cases in which prisoners die under the custody of the Bureau of Jail Management and Penology due to congestion. Dahil overcrowded po ito since the uh, war on drugs noon, uh, noon sa NCRPO, talagang massive. Uh, instead of uh, probably 60 yung dapat noon sa loob, maabot po ng mga dalawang daan, kaya maraming po namamatay. A believed inmate has testified in the hearing and said that the cause of sicknesses of prisoners is the quality of food. May namamatay? Marami po. Marami? Opo. Parang wala naman namatay sa masamang pagkain? Eh, puro pa ni isang pagkain, sir eh. Senator Risa Ontiveros has recommended that NBP Medical Officer Dr. Ursicio Senas be stripped of his medical license because of his involvement in the hospital for pass for sale issue. The senators also question why there has been a budget cut for the food of NBP inmates. In 2018, the budget for food subsistence allowance was more than 1 billion pesos for persons deprived of liberty or PDL or 60 pesos for every PDL per day. But the lowest bidding for food was 39 pesos. Hindi ko ma-reconcile bakit papakainin mo lang yung presyo ng 39 pesos worth of meals when binabudget na ng gobyerno, saan napupunta yung, uh, yung balance? According to Angelina Bautista, a caterer in the NBP Correctional Institution for Women, they won in the bidding in August 2018 but were eventually disqualified. Based on the information she gave, the disqualification was due to kickbacks. Sino sasabi siya magbigay ka? Yung mga inmates sir, yung presidente po ng inmate ng correctional. Presidente ng inmate, sino yung bibigyan mo raw? Yung mga personal sir, officers. A catering service firm also said they were blacklisted in 2017. They filed complaints with the Department of Justice then. We cannot participate nga po during the bidding because of doon nga po sa, ano, sa politics na nangyari din po. Former Bucor officer in charge, Rafael Rago, said 1 million pesos per month was the kickback received by the Bucor director from the catering service. But according to Senator Ronald Bato de la Rosa, there are no such offers during his time as Bucor chief, nor did he receive any kickbacks or bribe. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The Senate will continue conducting hearings even with the Congress going on a one-month recess starting this week. Joan Nano will tell us why. Congress has adjourned its session for a month-long break, but Senate said it is still business as usual in the upper chamber. Prior to its session adjournment Wednesday, Senate adopted Resolution No. 154 filed by Senate Majority Leader Juan Miguel Zubiri, which authorized the committees to conduct investigations on issues of national interest to aid in crafting relevant legislation. This means that all regular standing, oversight and special committees at the Senate can still conduct hearings and inquiry while Congress is on break. 
It also authorized committees to conduct hearings, meetings and consultations during every recess of the Senate to have a continuity in the process of passing pending proposed legislations. The resolution also stated that the committees are authorized to issue subpoena or subpoena duces tecum to any person, corporation, entity or its officers to testify and or produce such documents which may be needed in the meetings, hearings or consultations of the committees. But Senate Minority Leader Franklin Drillon clarified that standing committees except for the Blue Ribbon Committee could not conduct hearings on a resolution which is not read in the plenary and referred to a committee. The Blue Ribbon Committee could hold hearings motu proprio even if a resolution is not yet filed. Next week, Senate Finance Committee will tackle the proposed 4.1 trillion national expenditure program for 2020. Several committees have also scheduled technical working group meetings, according to the committee secretariat. The 18th Congress will start its break tomorrow, October 4, and its session will resume on November 4. Joan Nato, UN TV News and Rescue. The Intel Quad Force is holding only one warrant of arrest against alleged drug queen of Manila, Guia Gomez Castro. Meanwhile, the Bureau of Immigration cancels Gomez Castro's U.S. visa. Aiko Miguel tells us why. National Capital Region Police Office Director Police Major General Guillermo Eliazar says they have recently learned that Guia Gomez Castro's drug case was dismissed in 2009. This is why they are investigating how the case dismissed. So we're checking kung uh, ameno bang kababayaan uh, on the part of uh, the arresting officers, the investigators, as well as the witnesses. Dahil yung mga panahong yun, yun sinasabi natin kasagsagan nung kanyang influence dun sa ibang mga uh, even mga police. Eliazar adds the warrant of arrest the Quad Intel Force holds is in connection with her violation of the bouncing check law. Ang nakita lang natin is yung, uh, yung kanyang bouncing check. Well, you may consider this sabihin natin malit na kaso, pero kaso pa rin yan. And uh, that is the basis for us to arrest her. Eliazar also confirms Gomez Castro's visa to the United States has been cancelled. They believe she will be arrested soon. That will make her uh, illegal alien. So still, pwede rin siyang ma-deport. Ma With the laws and uh, the monitoring uh, 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 capability of the United States of America, for sure with the efforts that are being done by our, by our agencies, uh, liaisoning with our foreign counterparts, eh, lilit ang mundo niya doon. Eliezer advises Filipinos in America not to help or hide GIA. Tandaan nila na kung they will harbor itong hinahanap na sinasabi nating undocumented or uh, eventually undocumented or illegal alien na fugitive in a sense, eh baka magka-problema sila sa mga existing laws ng uh, uh, United States of America. Eliazar adds that aside from Gia, her husband Dennis and her brother Florencio Bombo Gomez, a dismissed policeman, are also in America. The Quad Intel Force are now coordinating with the International Criminal Police Organization or Interpol to find the three. The NCRPO director says they will file charges against them once they find sufficient evidence and once they finish gathering statements from witnesses. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. On day two of President Rodrigo Duterte's official visit to Russia this week, several agreements will be signed between the Philippines and Russia during his meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The Philippine chief executive is also set to speak at the Valdai Forum. Rosalie Cos tells us why. Today in Sochi City, Russia, President Rodrigo Duterte and Russian President Vladimir Putin will meet bilaterally on the sidelines of the Valdai Forum, while Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev met with President Duterte in Moscow yesterday. During your visit, there will also be a range of documents signed which are important for our bilateral relations. I am very glad to welcome you in Moscow, in the House of Russian Government. It is sometimes called the White House, but it is not the White House, which is in another country. It is the House of the Russian Government, although it is sometimes called the White House, but it is bigger and better. <laughs> We now have consultative mechanisms where we explore ways to expand our cooperation in various areas, including trade and investments, defense and security, energy, 
science and technology, among others. According to Philippine Ambassador to Russia, Carlos Soreta, the deals to be signed between the Philippines and Russia are on political consultation, health, research, science, and culture. The government also targets to have an energy cooperation with Russia. Russia can invest in the Philippine energy sector and set up plants for natural gases. Nuclear energy adoption is also possible. President Duterte is also expected to raise to President Putin the bilateral labor agreement for Filipino workers in Russia. There are about 10,000 Filipinos working in Russia, but most of them have no legal documents. Pag napirmahan yan, uh, maaring uh, magkaroon na ng legal status yung mga gusto magtrabaho dito. Uh, iba pang usapin yung legalization o amnesty nung nandito na, pero yun isusulong din uh, namin yun. President Duterte will also have a bilateral meeting with Jordanian King Abdullah II. Meanwhile, President Duterte is also scheduled to speak at the Valdai Forum in which world leaders and top Russian officials will attend. I think, first of all, the Philippines is in a very, very great position to speak about the Eastern perspective in the world order because we have very deep ties with, with uh, for example, the West. Our traditions, our values are heavily dependent on uh, Western education. But then we are located in the East. Our neighbors are, are all East. And uh, I think the President will have a very good perspective to share from, from that very unique point of view. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. Fire erupted on the catenary cable and post of the LRT2 between Anonas and Katipunan stations today. Some 200,000 commuters were affected as the LRT2 operations were suspended. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. Authorities have identified the cause of the fire at the LRT2 as power surge. According to a witness, the fire started on the catenary post, which emitted smoke as the train passed between Anonas and Katipunan stations. Makalagpas na lang po ng mulihan ng train, saka po umusok na malakas at saka po nagbuga ng apoy po dyan. Passengers were safely unloaded at the next station. No injury has been reported. The LRT2 management said two power rectifiers, numbers 5 and 6, were damaged which prompted them to suspend the entire LRT operations today. The management's investigation on the incident is underway. They say this is the first time such incident occurred. Cabrera said it is impossible to repair the damaged parts of the LRT2 immediately. But the LRT2 management is studying if partial operation is possible after confirming that other stations are safe to operate. As soon as we are able to do that, uh, determine that we can safely operate partial yes. operations, then we'll operate tayo again. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The estimated value of the damages caused by the fire that engulfed most parts of Star City yesterday has reached 1 billion pesos. Meanwhile, authorities continue to investigate into the cause of the incident. Harleen Delgado has more details. This is the aftermath of the fire in Star City yesterday. 90% of the theme park has been destroyed by the blaze. According to the Star City management, 20 indoor rides and attractions have been damaged, while none of the outdoor rides were affected. But according to Ed De Leon, the spokesperson of Star Parks Corporation and the owner of Star City, they will still try to reopen before the year ends, depending on the assessment on the ground. The investigation team from the Bureau of Fire Protection National capital region and Pasay City arrived at around noon to inspect the area, although they are considering electrical failure and arson. However, De Leon has earlier dismissed these, saying he believes it was an accident. Some tenant vendors in the compound who refused to be interviewed on camera also do not believe the fire was intentional. Barricade tape has been placed in front of the Star City entrance and in front of the Manila Broadcasting Company, which was also damaged by the fire. Hardly Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. 
I'm Alex Balbazar, and here are the headlines. The Skyway Management will temporarily stop the construction of the Skyway Extension Project on s -Slex in December. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority is contemplating on banning weekday sales in Metro Manila malls. The Department of Agriculture confirms the African swine fever virus entered the country through canned pork products. The missing Filipino fisherman after a bridge collapsed in Taiwan has been found dead. And world-class Filipino products featured at the Paris Premier Class 2019. Good evening. The National Bureau of Investigation releases the results of the forensic examination on the mobile phones of Bureau of Corrections personnel involved in the GCTA for sale issue. Rosalie Cos details why. Bucor Officer Veronica Buno's messages deleted from her mobile phone are just part of the results of the forensic examination conducted by the NBI. Buno apparently communicated with Maria Belinda Bansil, another Bucor officer, about money and a name filed on. The mobile phone of Veronica Buno contains deleted SMS conversation text messages to Benilda Bansil which made mention of the word uh, open quotation eight key comma air para yeah comma para comma batch uh, open and close parenthesis Veronica Bonio Chito comma Bibigay comma 50 key comma 100 key comma Filed on. The NBI also retrieved a message stating the reshuffle in Bucor and about Faeldon's signature. Senate Blue Ribbon Committee Chairman Senator Richard Gordon urges the two to divulge their knowledge on the alleged GCTA for sale. But Buno asked the senators for another executive session. Uh, we do fear lang po talaga na magsalita in public kasi sir, uh, yung mga possible na mabanggit. But the committee decided to cite the two Bucor personnel in contempt until they expose the truth. I will give you three days to think about it or two days to think about it. Two days na lang. Uh, because, uh, we have also other duties. Two days to think about it and after which we will uh, make the necessary decision. Buno admitted in a previous hearing she received 50,000 pesos from an inmate's wife for the early release of her husband. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. The Skyway Management will temporarily stop the construction of the 5-kilometer extension project on the South Luzon Expressway or SLEX in December. The area stretches from Susana Heights to Alabang in Mundinlupa. Sherwin Golubong tells us why. Skyway Operations and Maintenance Corporation or SOMCO President Manuel Bonoan says the temporary halt of the Skyway project is to give way to the expected high volume of vehicles to pass through SLEX during the long holiday. Wala kami gagawin na trabaho dyan na nakadagdag sa pagka-traffic dyan sa baba. Wala kami gagawin. I see. Until matapos ang December. Come November, motorists may use the closed off lane occupied by the ongoing construction, Bonoan adds. The Skyway management is also planning to set window hours for bigger trucks to avoid much heavier traffic. Meanwhile, the East Service Road in Muntinlupa City will be one way beginning next week. The Skyway management assures that motorists will experience convenient travel once the project is completed by December 2020. Sherwin Kulubong, UNTB News and Rescue, Muntinlupa City. The Department of the Interior and Local Government will finalize their validation report on the clearing operations in Metropolitan Manila two days from now. They are expected to publicize their report next week. Joanano tells us why. Local chief executives are confident they will pass the DILG's evaluation after the 60-day period to conduct clearing operations. Sa kanila, ginawa namin ang trabaho namin, ginawa namin ang dapat. Kaya 
very confident kami na makakapasak. They admit, however, no one can get a perfect score since it is inevitable that there are still some violators. You cannot expect 100%. Bakit? Kasi kunyari, movable na sasakyan o motorsiklo. Kaya alam naman natin lahat, no? lahat tayo nagdadaan sa kalsada. Alam natin na may pupuslit kung makaka Puslit, diba? Ay, hindi naman po ibig sabihin no, that at any given time ay 100% cleared po ito. After the DILG finalized their report on October 5, they will next identify if there are mayors to be suspended for failure or negligence to comply with the president's order. The agency also clarified they will be the one who will rate the mayors and will not recognize claims of 100% compliance. It was a self-assessment made by the local uh, officials themselves but these are not assessment made independently uh, by a third party in this case. We will be fair in the evaluation. The DILG validation team is checking if all obstructions on roads and sidewalks have already been eliminated. They are also checking if amendments to or reviews of city ordinances have been made. The DILG will also assess the transfer of vendors and the rehabilitation of public roads. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue, Makati City. The Department of Public Order and Safety, or DPOS, demolished some business establishments and fences in Barangay Bagong Pag-asa, Quezon City, although the residents requested to postpone the demolition. DPOS explains they returned to Bagong Pag-asa after residents failed to self-demolish. Aiko Miguel tells us why. Residents of Barangay Bagong Pag-asa pleaded to DPOS to postpone the demolition of parts of their houses that are considered as obstruction on sidewalks. Some residents complained the demolition of their fences and business signage was abrupt. But Rudy Palma, the barangay chairman of Bagong Pag-asa, insisted the residents were given ample time to self-demolish. So yung pong aming... Uh... Uh, ginawang uh, communication sa kanila para hindi sila mabigla. Uh, siguro, yung iba sa atin, sa amin, dito yung mga residente, okay, okay, okay. ay akala hindi ganun ka ano ang, uh, ang programa ng ating uh, gobyerno. One of the structures depots demolished today was Redolin Small Eatery. Kasi lahat po na napundar po, naubos, dahil po may breast cancer po ako, bilyan na lang po nila ako ng ang gamot para po humaba pa po yung buhay ko at saka mga ano ko, mailipat po sila sa magandang pwesto. Yun lang po. No. Gamot lang po talaga. Dipos is decisive to follow the government's mandate to remove public road obstructions. Ang objective lang po dito is to reacquire public road. Okay. Ay, Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The MMDA plans to ban holiday sales in Metro Manila malls during weekdays to prevent worsening the current traffic situation in EDSA. Vincent Arbaleda will tell us why. Traffic situation in Metro Manila, especially on EDSA, is expected to worsen this holiday season. To ease heavy traffic, the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA plans to ban holiday sales in malls across Metro Manila. According to MMDA Assistant General Manager for Planning, retired General Jose Ocampo, malls should schedule their mall-wide sale only on weekends. It will add to the congestion, but during our uh, own uh, weekdays. But on weekends, of course, we have a time pasok sa opisina and other uh, place of work, pwede sila sa mall. There are 34 malls in Metro Manila, according to Ocampo. 17 of them are located along EDSA. The MMDA also plans to re-implement the 2018 holiday scheme for this year. The MMDA stakeholders and mall operators are scheduled to meet this month to finalize the holiday traffic scheme for the last part of the year. If finalized, the holiday scheme will be implemented from November to January of 2020. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. Four barangays in Quezon City are confirmed to have cases of African swine fever virus infection. The Department of Agriculture warns about the claim of anti-ASF medicines that have surfaced on social media. Ray Pelayo reports why. 20,000 hugs have already been called in different areas in Luzon, particularly in Rizal, Bulacan, and Pampanga. In Quezon City, four areas have been identified to have cases of ASF virus infection. 
Mayor Joy Belmonte says calling operations in those barangays are ongoing even in Pasong Tamo where the result of tests of hogs is pending. Agriculture Secretary William Dar says African swine fever was introduced in the country through canned pork products used in restaurants or hotels. Leftovers of those canned pork products were dumped in Rodriguez Rizal and eventually used as wheel feed. The virus then spread in Giginto, Bulacan through the delivery of hogs and reached other areas of Bulacan. The DA now considers the transportation of hogs as a major challenge in preventing the proliferation of the ASF virus. It calls on local government units to beef up the operation of checkpoints. If there are no documents uh, certifying, I want uh, palampasin itong uh, mga trinity trade na mga baboy sa iba't ibang uh, probinsya. The DA warns the public not to believe the claims of anti-ASF medicines that are now spreading on social media. Wala akong bakuna o gamot pa sa ASF. So there will be no claim na yung antibiotic na yan po ay magiging effect para malunasan po yung ASF. The DA will study how much they can add to the 3,000 peso compensation for every swine called. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Justice Secretary Minardo Guevara calls on Congress to consider lowering the age of criminal responsibility to 12. He says this is to deter the involvement of minors in illegal drugs. My Bermudas will tell us why. The bill seeking to lower the minimum age of criminal responsibility from 15 to 9 years old failed its bid to pass before the 17th Congress ended. Several versions have undergone committee-level debates in the Senate and the House which pushed for setting it from 9 to 12 years old. Under the bill, minors involved in crimes such as kidnapping, murder, serious illegal detention, parricide, infanticide, and illegal drug trade may face charges in court. Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara says he is seeking for Congress's approval of such mechanism. Ang gusto lang namin sabihin doon ay uh, consider very carefully yung uh, proposal to reduce the criminal responsibility age no, of uh, children. Because right now, uh, 15 and below, di ba? they're free from criminal responsibility. Kaya nga sila ang ginagamit ng mga couriers huh? uh, in the illegal drug trade. Kasi hindi naman makukulong yung mga bata na yan. Eh, no? Guevara adds reducing the minimum age of criminal responsibility to 12 will make it harder for criminal syndicates to use minors in illegal activities. But uh, somehow, if you reduce the age of criminal responsibility, maybe halimbawa to something like 12, eh baka mahihirapan na ang mga criminal syndicates to make use of you know, very, very uh, young children in their nefarious activities. Meanwhile, via continuous trial, plea bargaining, probation, and decongestion of jails, Supreme Court Chief Justice Lucas Bersamin says the problem of congested jails due to the overcrowding of inmates involved in illegal drugs is being resolved. If that indicates anything, it is that uh, our policies adopted by the Supreme Court are working. Meron na kaming judicial affidavit rule, yun din ay nakakapagpabilis. My Bermudez, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. 400 exhibitors and creators took part in the recently concluded Paris Fashion Week. These include Filipino designers who showcase traditional yet fashionable creations. Peaching Vizcara Garin details why. Eight notable and well-loved Filipino fashion accessory and ready-to-wear brands participated in the Premier Class Fashion Trade Show on September 27 to 30, 2019 at the heart of the Paris Fashion Week in Jada de Tuileries, Paris, France, among which are eco-friendly bags made of woven recycled plastic. We make pieces out of recycled plastic, so we make small bags, larger bags, and some homeware. So everything we made is out of recycled plastic, made from household bottles, the thicker ones, like your water bottle caps. That we melt it into strips and make it into this machine woven material. And then everything we make is assembled by hand. Accessories made of native materials using traditional age-old techniques. 
These are all made of wood and it's hand carved, hand painted in the Philippines. It's made in Paeta, Laguna and they're very well known for wood carvings. Um, with each style, each piece, it really comes from different parts of the Philippines. So it's all really a mix of different materials, different techniques that come from different parts of the country. Another Pinoy exhibitor showcased bags designed with rice beads. Because my husband, before he be, became a designer, he was a farmer. Because we came from Nueva Ecija. And this collection is a tribute to the farmers. These are all rice beads and we uh, uh, plated 24 karat. And so this is our harvest couture bag. Premier Class is the internationally acclaimed reference in the fashion accessory scene. By participating in such event, the Department of Trade and Industry, the Philippine Embassy in France, and the Center for International Trade Expositions and Missions, or CITEM, which is DTI's export promotion arm, aim to promote Filipino creations in the international market. Pitching Biscala Garin, UNTV News and Rescue, Paris, France. And to complete the most significant news for this day, Why News Continues, here are the top stories. Embattled PNP Chief Oscar Albayalde is unfazed. He maintains the decision on the case of so-called ninja cops in Pampanga did not change when he made a phone call to PDEA Chief Aaron Aquino, who was then the PNP Regional 3 Director. April Senedoza reports. Tension rose at the Senate when PDEA Chief Aaron Aquino added his previous statement. PNP Chief Police General Oscar Albayalde called him requesting not to implement the dismissal order of 13 Pampanga cops involved in anomalous drug operation. It was on November 14, 2014 when such dismissal order was released. But it took two years before the accused were given copies of the order on March 2, 2016. The cops filed a motion for reconsideration on March 14, 2016. It was only on October 17 when the cops' appeal was partially granted. In an ambush interview, an embattled Albayalde remains firm. It's pretty normal to ask for the status of the ninja cops when he called the Kino. You cannot implement a dismissal while the MR is ongoing. That's basic. Walang nag-iba doon sa desisyon, no? That call with the status is pretty normal. April Senedoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. Meanwhile, authorities in Taiwan have found the remaining Filipino fisherman who went missing after a bridge collapsed on Tuesday. He was the third Philippine citizen killed in the incident. Amiel Pascual has the details. The death toll of Filipinos who died after a bridge collapse in the Nanfang Ao Fish Harbor in Suwa Township in October 1, 2019 has now reached three. This after a missing Filipino fisherman, Romulo Escalicas Jr., 29, has been found dead. A total of six migrant fishermen working on Taiwanese fishing boats, three Indonesian and three Filipinos, were killed in the accident. They were trapped when the bridge above the entrance to the port of the Nanfang Ao suddenly ruptured and collapsed Tuesday morning, crushing their boats. The company responsible for managing the bridge, Taiwan International Ports Corporation Limited, said it will provide 5 million Taiwan dollars or 8.3 million pesos in compensation to the families of those killed. The incident also left at least 10 others injured, including five more Filipinos. According to Angelito Banayo, chairman of the Manila Economic and Cultural Office, or MECO, they have assisted the families of the victims to fly to Taiwan. Namatay, you know, yung pamilya nila na sa Pilipinas, uh, dinadala natin dito. Uh, yung isa nga, eh, nakakuha na ng ticket at parating na siguro mamayang, either mamayang gabi or bukas sa madaling araw. Yung uh, isa naman uh, ay um, tutulungang makakuha kagad ng passport kasi wala pang passport. So tutulungan nyo sa DFA. Yung isa, kanina lang kasi natin nalaman, so na napagsabihan na yung pamilya, ina-arrange na siguro yung pagbalik dito. Officials at the Philippine Overseas Labor Office in Taipei have visited the Filipino survivors in a hospital and provided the necessary assistance. The Filipino survivors are Julio Gimawa, Jason Villaruel, Alan Alcansano, Jan Vicente Royo, and June Flores. 
According to the Labor Department, the victim's children will get scholarship benefits from the department. Meanwhile, investigators today examine possible structural problems with a 140-meter bridge. A 2016 report on bridges in Elan County had found problems with the expansion joints on the Nanfang Ao Bridge, which was completed in 1998, the official Central News Agency reported. The joints are designed to absorb changes in temperature. CNA cited the report as saying that motorists could sense a difference of levels on either side of the joints, possibly as a result of warping or other problems. Taiwan International Ports Corporation Limited has earlier said it cleaned the joints and fixed other problems, such as rusted steel reinforcements and guardrails in 2017 and 2018. Experts are also looking into the condition of the bridge's steel cables, including the possibility of dangerous levels of corrosion. Amiel Pascual, UNTV News and Rescue, Taiwan. In other news, a hailstorm struck several parts of Quezon City this afternoon amid a thunderstorm warning issued in some parts of Metro Manila. A video by a UNTV News crew shows how heavy rain with grains of ice pours in their vehicles parked in Quezon City. The Philippine Astronomical, Geophysical and Atmos Astro Astronomic Services Administration says the incident is, however, normal in the Philippines. Pagasa said hailstorms are caused by thunderstorms. Meanwhile, one of the priorities of Mayor Isco Moreno Domagoso is to make Manila a trash-free city. What is the city government doing with its garbage problem? Find out as Harleen Delgado reports. Since day one in office, Mayor Isco Moreno Domagoso has promised a clean and green Manila city. He wants to turn a dirty and filthy nation's capital to a conveniently livable place for his constituents. Mayor Isco has been able to restore pungent smelling monuments and shrines in the city. But one of the biggest problems is garbage. Over 100 tons of garbage was collected from July to September 15, 2019 in Manila City, based on a Department of Public Service or DPS accomplishment report. According to DPS Manila City Chief Kenneth Amorau, the lack of discipline of some residents is one of the challenges they are facing. He says some do not dispose of their trash during collection hours, which results in the dumping of garbage on streets. Sa mga balak namin gawin through the leadership of Mayor Isko na magkaroon ng, ng ipin o uh, pangil yung batas na magpaparusa doon sa mga magtatapon ng wala sa oras at wala sa lugar. Aside from the DPS, two contractors collect trash from the 896 barangays across Manila City daily. To lessen plastics that end up in landfills, the department is gearing its programs toward waste diversion and recycling. These include the creation of eco bins made of pet bottles, which the department plans to distribute to local schools. Echo blocks made of plastic bottles stuffed with single-use plastics and the use of trash crushers to decrease the volume of collected trash. The official adds some foreign countries have offered help to Manila City to venture into the process of waste to energy. The Department of Energy and Natural Resources defines waste to energy as the energy recovered from waste or the conversion of non-recyclable waste materials into usable heat, electricity, or fuel through a variety of processes. One of the countries willing to assist Manila is Belgium. The Belgian government has made the offer after seeing thousands of tons of garbage recovered from the Baseco Beach during the 31st International Coastal Cleanup last September 21. Korea has also offered help, which was welcomed by the mayor. Mayor Domagoso says it might greatly help in resolving the city's garbage problem as long as it abides with the law. For example, ng DNR. No? Eh ba bakit hindi, di ba? Hindi makamura tayo sa kuryente, uh, pero saan galing? Sa basura. However, Amaral believes this must be further studied to ensure no environmental loss is violated, specifically the Clean Air Act. 
In a 2016 report of the National Solid Waste Management Commission, Metro Manila generated over 9,000 tons of solid waste per day, which was the biggest volume generated across the country. A World Bank report, meanwhile, estimates that solid waste produced by Philippine cities will increase further due to the projected hike in the urban population by 2025. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. And for the news abroad, here's Kath Dumaraos reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. Kath, good evening. Good evening, William. U.S. President Donald Trump has lashed out at congressional Democrats after they vowed to issue legal summonses to the White House this week. Committees are demanding documents relating to the administration's dealings with Ukraine, which is now at the heart of an impeachment inquiry. This report will tell us why. U.S. President Donald Trump kept up his assaults on the Democratic lawmakers leading impeachment proceedings on Wednesday, accusing House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff of treason, as well as attacking the unidentified whistleblower who reported concerns about his behavior. The Republican president has lashed out repeatedly at the impeachment inquiry, which was prompted by his phone call with the Ukrainian president that sought an investigation that would be damaging to a Democratic political opponent, former Vice President Joe Biden. Trump repeatedly says he did nothing wrong in his July 25th telephone call in which he asked Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to investigate a domestic political rival Joe Biden, the former U.S. Vice President. He has repeatedly attacked the Democratic Chairman of the House of Representatives Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, who is leading the impeachment inquiry. They should look at him for treason because he is making up the words of the President of the United States. Not only words, but the meaning. He accused the Democrats' impeachment efforts of being groundless and politically motivated. They've been trying to impeach me from the day I got elected. He again referred to his call with the Ukrainian leader as perfect. Earlier, Democrats have accused the White House of blocking congressional inquiries and refusing to respond to record requests, which has prompted a subpoena threat this week. The subpoena will request documents on Trump's call with Ukraine and any related items from acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney. We are deeply concerned about uh, Secretary Pompeo's effort now to uh, potentially interfere with witnesses who whose testimony is needed before our committee, many of whom are mentioned in the whistleblower complaint. Um, and we want to make it abundantly clear that any effort by the secretary, by the president, or anyone else to interfere with the Congress's ability to call before it relevant witnesses will be considered as evidence of obstruction of the lawful functions of Congress. Kat Numara, also in TV News and Rescue. The 2020 Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, 78, has canceled campaign events after undergoing a heart procedure. Sanders was treated in hospital for an arterial blockage after experiencing chest pain at an event in Nevada on Tuesday. Sanders had earlier announced his campaign had raised over $25 million. The presidential hopeful tweeted that he was recalled taking the opportunity to promote his health care policy inspired by Britain's National Health Service. At least five people died and hundreds others were injured in Baghdad as well as other cities after nationwide anti-government protests devolved into violence. Meanwhile, seven people were killed when a World War II-era bomber plane crashed in flames at an international airport in Connecticut, USA. Mirasola Bogadil details why. In the USA, seven people have died after a rare World War II airplane crashed and burst into flames at an airport in the U.S. state of Connecticut. There were 13 people aboard the vintage Boeing B-17 dubbed the Flying Fortress when it crashed outside Hartford on Wednesday morning. The aircraft was civilian registered and was not being flown by the U.S. military, aviation officials say. According to the Federal Aviation Administration, the plane crashed at the end of the runway during an attempted landing. 
Meanwhile, a San Francisco tour guide charged with being an undercover agent of the Chinese government was ordered held without bail on Tuesday after a federal magistrate judge found that he presented a potential flight risk. Shui Ha Peng, also known as Edward Peng, did not enter a plea during a detention hearing in U.S. District Court in San Francisco. The 56-year-old naturalized U.S. citizen was arrested in the San Francisco suburb of Hayward, California last week. A federal court indictment accused him of picking up U.S. national security secrets from so-called debt drops in exchange for envelopes of cash and delivering them to the Ministry of State Security in Beijing. Peng was ordered to return on October 15 for further proceedings, the U.S. Attorney's Office said. And in Iraq. Five people were killed and at least 132 wounded on Wednesday in renewed nationwide clashes between demonstrators and Iraqi security forces. The largest display of public anger against Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi's year old government. The protests, which started on Tuesday over unemployment, corruption and poor public services, have escalated. A curfew is in effect in the Iraqi capital Baghdad and three other cities. The restrictions will remain in place until further notice. Mirasol Abugadi, UNTV News and Rescue. In a rare moment in the U.S. crime history, a man forgives his brother's killer in the courtroom where she was sentenced to a decade in prison. Beverly Sison has this report. A former U.S. police officer who shot dead her neighbor inside his own apartment in Dallas has been sentenced to 10 years in prison for murder. Amber Geiger, 31, argued she killed Botham Jean, 26, after mistakenly thinking she was in her own flat and that he was an intruder. The jury's sentence was less than the 28 years prosecutors had sought. A four-year police veteran, Geiger, did not testify in the sentencing hearing, which included emotional testimony from Jean's relatives and friends. His father, Bertram, cried as he described the pain following the murder. I'll never see him again, and I want to see him, I still want to see him. <laughs> it's hard. Geiger, who had spent four years on the force before the killing, took the rare step of testifying in her own defense during her trial, tearfully expressing regret for shooting Jean, but saying she had believed her life was in danger when she pulled the trigger. I was scared. Whoever was inside my apartment was going to kill me. And I'm sorry. I have to live with that every single day that I Prosecutors argue that Geiger did little to help Jean even after realizing her mistake, calling the 911 emergency phone number for an ambulance but not administering first aid. They also show the jury several text messages that painted Geiger as racist. But after the sentence was handed down, Jean's younger brother Brandt said he wanted to speak directly to Geiger. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I. I forgive you, and I know if you go to God and ask Him, He will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. After his testimony, Brand Jean then asked the judge's permission to hug Geiger, and the two embraced for about a minute. <laughs> Beverly Sison, UNTV News and Rescue, USA. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you very much, Kath Dumaraos, reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand.
The World Teachers Day 2019 will be celebrated on Saturday, October 5. Watch some stories of love that teachers have towards their students as Mon Hoxon reports. Teachers are said to be our second parents. We spend several hours with them in our schools. They show us love and support and guide us towards the right direction in life. This video of a teacher in Sultan Kudarat in Mindanao has gone viral on social media. To show her love to her students, she drew all of them and gave the drawing as a gift for their graduation. The little present made her students happy. It gave them inspiration for another chapter in their lives. Another simple gesture from another teacher. Mrs. Merlita Narne made chair cushion covers for each of her students. She wanted them to sit comfortably during class. Because of this, many netizens admire Mrs. Merlita's dedication to her students. But teachers are not the only ones who expresses their love and concern towards their students. A post by Michelle Legaspi is also trending on social media. According to the post, the students of Mr. Cesar Punzalan in a school in San Pedro, Laguna noticed their teacher's shoes were old and worn out. The entire class chipped in and decided to surprise their teacher with a new pair of shoes. For the students, the new shoes are nothing compared with how Mr. Punzalan teaches them in school. Mr. Punzalan was touched and thankful for the gift he received. May the celebration for our teachers be not only for a day. The littlest of gestures may be appreciated by our second parents every single day as a symbol of our gratitude for what they do and sacrifice for our education. Monokson, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this October 3, 2019. On behalf of Alex Baltazar and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo. And before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. And yung mga report po na sinabmit ng uh, office ni uh, Colonel Paloyo, through the provincial director at nakarating po sa amin sa regional office. Ako na po ang magsasabi, puro po kasi, kasinungalingan yun. Iko-confirm ko po. Kaniya na kasi nungalingan? Yung kanilang spot report. Kasinungalingan po lahat yun. That was an attempt to cover up the what really happened. You cannot implement a dismissal while the MR is ongoing. That's basic. Walang nag-iba doon sa desisyon, no? That call with the status is pretty normal. Tinext na kagad ako nung, nung security ko at tinext na rin siya ng isang, isang gun for hire na yung kilala niyang gun for hire eh may kumausap na raw at uh, pinagpan ako. So I just have to, you know, uh, be conscious of my security, making sure na lalo-lalo na sa aking family. 20% of maximum NBP allocation. Sorry? And on NBP, ano, sir, you believe it, please? You believe it? Yes, 20%. Yes, po. Because there are about uh, 26,000. 26,000. So 5,200 na mamatay taon-taon, Mr. Chair? Uh, so, that's a lot. Because of the overcrowding, sir, minsan. Eh. Because of the overcrowding? Yes, po. Yung, po at minsan, and then, hindi natin ma-contain ma minsan yung PTV po. 